and running. Okay, hello. Yeah, welcome again to to our third part of the ZK Performance Tips session. Um, I'm again Robert. Uh, I think you all know me already, so I don't need to introduce myself too long. Um, I think we just go into what we've been um, missing out or skipping over last time. Again, uh, it was quite a busy week, so I didn't have the time to prepare many examples. I have a few things that are easy to prepare, and I will have to yeah, we, we will talk about things or discuss uh, items. Uh, if you have questions, yeah, feel free to ask in the chat. Um, you can send me private messages if you don't want to um, expose them to everyone. I will anonymize them in the end when I'm sharing the chat. And if you don't want to appear at all, then just tell me in the chat as well that you want your message to be removed. And yes, um, why is the chat not unmuted? Um, I will also mute you, Andreas. Sorry. Um, but by default, everyone should be muted, so there's no unexpected noise appearing in the in the recording. Okay. Um, yeah, I got a few questions since last time, um, which I would like to start with first. Maybe they already um, cover a few of the topics we would like to. I would like to talk about it. I think a few of them we already covered of, of these items here at the, the at the most common performance killers. I call them yeah, the things you you can easily avoid, or maybe you should plan to avoid if it's not easy, because they just um, cause more performance uh, impact than you maybe expect. Um, and maybe maybe just start with a simple one. Um, yeah, multi-page navigation and iframes. Um, okay, someone asked for a training. Okay, no problem. Yeah, that's something else. Okay, I want to discuss it today, the transitions and animations. So we, we start with multi-page navigation. Um, so the, 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 the background is whenever ZK loads a new page by changing the URL in the browser or uh, by, um, yeah, no, mostly by changing the URL or by refreshing the URL in the browser, it will download again all the scripts uh, that need to run ZK, or if already cached, it will at least evaluate them again in the browser. There will be a small flickering when the page is re-rendering, and depending on your connection size, this may take longer than you than you need. And that's in these cases, I always um, suggest um, to use a single page application because there you can just replace the parts of the view you want to replace and keep the stuff that you don't want to replace, or at least um, just re-render everything without re-downloading and re-evaluating or re-initializing the ZK's, uh, ZK's client engine. And just for comparison, I created um, two, I uh, know it's just a Zool example. Uh, it's, it's two simple um, examples, one is a multi-page, application just showing what uh, what the multi-page application does so you have a link and this link um, it just just goes to another page and the other page uh, goes back to the previous page and it's the most simple case I can think of um, it could be slightly different if you have a link with a server-side click listener and um, this server-side listener is then um, posting a redirect. In this case, you even have the additional overhead of going to the server once just to return with the redirect and then the client will re-render, re-initialize ZK completely. And if you don't need to reload the page because you go to a different server or for security reasons, maybe you want to start with a fresh session and you have to reload the, the browser, um, this is easily avoidable. So we just look into what this does. Um, I already I just move the browser into my screen. So what we see here is the server is not running. Okay, let's just start the server. Blah, blah, blah. And as you can see, I just used the latest version of ZK again, just released yesterday, just to see if we can find any problems with it as soon as possible. Uh, and reload. Okay, now we have the multi-page one. And whenever I click it, it goes to the second page and back to the first page. As you can or maybe cannot see on the right side, the complete browser DOM is replaced. And also in the in the network, that's what I mean. I mean when you 
just measure, yeah, look at things, how they happen. Uh, just check what's going on whenever you click something. So I go to the second page and it's indeed, how can I make this, I want the small request rows today. So I just chose all requests. You see it's re-downloading or re-requesting every, every resource file of ZK. Um, like font files. In this case, it's loading them from cache, so it's not too bad. Um, but in case the cache was disabled, you can just see how large the files are, and this is the, the JavaScript the browser has to parse. Maybe browsers are clever enough to keep a pre-parsed version of a JavaScript file in, uh, in their uh, engine. That's something I, I don't know about. In any case, they have to run the code to initialize ZK again and maybe re-download um, depending packages that are loaded um, as separate JavaScript files. And it could be, for example, the Zool WND, the window package for the window component is loaded in addition to the, the default ZK page, uh, to the ZK WPD. So if we go to the next page, you can see it's downloading stuff again. And if we enable the cache, we can at least see it's and preserve the log. And now we can see it's just a whole bunch of stuff the browser has to do. If we instead go to a single page application, and then I'll show you how this can be done in a very, very simple case. And there are many ways of doing single page applications uh, in ZK, but that's just not to go too much into details. Now we have a single page. I go to page two, I go to page one. In this case, you see there's a lot less, um, or there's no flickering at all. It's just replacing the DOM. In the elements tab, we should see what's being replaced. You see something flashing. You see these two divs are only replaced and the rest, the body, the head, and the HTML element don't get replaced. And yeah, inside here, you see that the links change. And also on the network, we see the request is much smaller. It's only downloading 530 bytes. In this case, because the page is very small, because this is something you have to download anyway. If components change, if new components are added, these have to be downloaded, both in a new, uh, in a new Zool file or in an AJAX request. And what we can see here is in the response, it's just outer means something like, uh, outer is the somehow the, the, the client side name of invalidation. So it's it it's clearing all the contents of one component of this include component here, and it's just adding new components into it. Yeah, new window and new link, and as many components as you have. So how can this be done? I think it's most should be obvious to every one of you huh? um, using ZK for a while. Uh, the include component is the simplest component you have available in every uh, in every um, edition of ZK. So you can simply um, change the source attribute. And this can be done by uh, calling a setter or by having a data binding on the source attribute, which will call the setter internally triggered by the data binding or you can do this from Java code if you have access in a composer. It doesn't really matter. I just put it here into the Zool file so we, we can see this more easily. And in the single page, all I'm doing is I'm I'm forwarding an event to the to the main include and I forward the on-click event into a custom navigation event, and then I pass in some data to navigate. Um, yes, if your um, question was, um, shouldn't we prefer apply over include? That's true, yes. If you have the apply element, then um, prefer the apply, especially for MVVN, that's useful. Um, but in this simple example, include component is good enough. Or if you have, um, if you're using MVC and you don't have a problem with accessing components directly, just call create components, uh, executions, create components, and load a Zool file directly. You don't need the uh, the include component to to clear components and, and load a new one. It's just for this example, it's, it's easier for me to demonstrate. So it, you just demonstrate that ZK is able of replacing parts at any, or at any part of your DOM with new elements without reloading the rest. And that's where you can save a lot of, um, 
yeah, a lot of time, performance, in expensive uh, operations. And in this case, multi-page is the worst because it's just reloading everything. Like I said, sometimes you want to reload, especially for, for, for security reasons, you sometimes have to change the session or clear the session and reload, then totally fine. Or after a login page, I think it's somewhere recommended to have a redirect after login. Uh, I don't fully know the, 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 info, uh, the, the reasoning about this why, but in these cases, a login page usually is anyway quite small, so it shouldn't be a big uh, waste to throw it away and start a new page that's then larger. And in many cases, you have the login anyway in an external system, so it's not part of your ZK application. Um, so yes, um, if you have the chance, uh, use apply, especially for MVVM. And as always, if you can control directly from Java code and there are no unexpected surprises like in the include component, just use executions create components. So it's um, execution executions dot create components and this one has many overloaded um, functions and there you can say um, load a zool file into this parent or uh, load a pre-parsed page definition into this um, into this place so there's there are many ways of using executions create components internally both the include component and the apply element call the same method yeah, to create creating components So it's just one easy thing you can do if you plan to do a uh, single page applications on um, ZK can do this and it usually is the faster way to update uh, the UI. Okay, what else can we say about and I know this is very simple, but there's not much else. The details are very specific to every application, uh, MVVM or Java or Richlet uh, uh, or MVC or Richlet. They have many different ways of adding and removing components in ZK. Okay, the second question we had was um, about long operations. Uh, I think we already had a, a full um, ex, a full training session just about um, server push, long op operations and event queues. So I, I will not repeat everything there. Just show one simple way of um, of how to avoid you know, waiting, waiting on the client side. Yeah, if there is some expensive task you need to do, and you have to do it because of your application logic, there's uh, nothing you can um, like save there. If this exp if this operation is expensive, it will just take as long as it takes. But you can uh, improve the user experience in these cases. Uh, we've seen the the previous example of um, of the long, I think the long busy operation or something, where we just had a long waiting or long busy when you click a button. Come on, open, open, open. You see the, the page is just loading a very long time because it's doing something for 10 seconds on the server side before displaying the page. Uh, and, and that's because there is a, a synchronous task running, in this case, just a thread.sleep, but it could be any, expensive database operation that maybe populates contents of a list box, but the rest of the page doesn't have to wait for it. It can just render an empty list box and fill the data later. And that's the, the plan we have now. Um, so if we look into the old example, the long busy waiting, I think it was nothing special. There's just a composer that does something um, non-ideal. Uh, in the do after compose, it's waiting or calling database or doing a heavy computation on a, in a very busy way. It doesn't need to be waiting, it can also be very busy. And this is something we want to not do on the, on the initialization of the page. We want to do this later and then update the client. And this will hopefully give the user the impression that your page, page is much more responsive. Even if the, the long operation takes four hours, uh, four hours, four, four seconds uh, or 10 seconds um, on the server side, but he will see something and, and can look around and then he will see our oh, data is loading here. Data will be soon available. It doesn't look like the page is broken uh, like my previous case. So for this, we just I just rewrote the example slightly and I provide um, a simple, the, the most simple way of doing this. 
I know there are many different ways using event queues, using executions, um, activate, deactivate directly. Um, I just chose the simplest one, which is the event executions.schedule, uh, just because it has the simplest API. So what we do is we have our do after compose. Um, and what we do is we update our UI initially, just show something in instantly to the user. This could be a complicated UI with navigation and everything that's static, that doesn't require long computation. Just push it out so the user has something to look at, something to read, and then start your asynchronous task in the background. Maybe if you want, just call clients show busy uh, to give them some kind of busy animation. Uh, you don't have to, but you can. That's up to you. I just output the text, please wait. Well, and you can output an image that animates whatever you choose. And then we run our async task. In order to run asynchronous task, we have to enable server push so that the server can send some data to the client side um, directly. Uh, because HTTP protocol is request response uh, traditionally, and the server push will will either use um, um, a, or will use the server push implementation you chose or you have available. There's a polling version that will poll in intervals and ask the server, is something done, is something done? There's a commit implementation that will um, have a long running request that will then instantly respond and tell the client something is ready. Or if you use WebSockets, it will use the WebSocket channel. Here, just use the default because it, it, it shouldn't matter for your application which implementation is done. I just enable it. Then I run a background thread. Uh, in, since Java 8, we have these nice run async um, functions that just do something in a thread. We don't have to care about thread pools. Of course, you have to care about thread pools. If your application has dedicated thread pools, there are additional ways of, of defining which, um, which execution how is it called, Ex which executor this is using on which thread pool and how big the thread pool is. I just use the default here. And then I perform a heavy task. I wait for five seconds. And then I tell ZK, um, please schedule the, an event as soon as possible and tell the client something is done. Now the answer is 42, long operation. It took a while to compute. And then it will update the UI again. The update UI function will just clear some children and append some new children. This could be something like in a list box, clearing dummy items and sending out the correct data. Or any other operation here, just add new label uh, in ZK. Or for this example, it doesn't matter what I change, I just update the UI. And um, yeah, let's just, just run it and see what it does. And then we switch to a more complex example just to give you something more flexible. So we go to the part three, long async task. Now see it's computing, the, the screen appears instantly. And after five seconds, the answer is 42. And what I also made sure is that the server push stops. So it doesn't occupy any, any additional um, long running requests to the server. That's what I did here. I disabled the server push in the end. I enabled server push faults. When the, when the task is done. So that's a very simple way of just doing something later and not having to explicitly wait. It will just take as long as it takes. The server will have something to do in the background and the client will wait. And the good thing is the button is already responding. So while the server is doing the long operation, I can still perform other operations in the UI. So this one is coming from the server. You see, I click the button and the response is just a log message. Could be adding labels, could be um, doing something else in the UI, could be a navigation event being fired to the server. Um, as simple as that. In this context, I often hear questions of how to cancel a long operation. Um, and this is not a question for ZK. This is um, a question for Java and you have to implement your, your tasks and your long operations um, um, I'll come back to your question in a second um, yeah if you if you want to cancel a task you need to somehow 
create a, a future, uh, I think uh, cancel the future or something. There, there are some implementations in Java where you can cancel. And even then you have to use only specific methods that are cancelable. So Java is very strict about handling threats. and You can't just tear down any threat without breaking something. So uh, this is a, a topic on Java, how to cancel a task. Otherwise, by clicking this button you know, that I implemented, if your task is cancelable, if you can somehow signal to your threat, please, please stop doing what you do. For example, by setting the interrupted flag, it can then stop. Otherwise, the threat will do what it does. Um, the question was, what happens if we don't enable server push? And that's very easy. And we just disable it and check it. My prediction is it should give an error. So we wait for the five seconds. Um, I didn't recompile the code, right? I didn't start in debug mode. Okay, need to restart in debug mode. Come to the hot code replacement without debug mode. Okay, so it should fail when, when calling execution schedule. It should say, I can't schedule the task from a background thread because server push is not activated. So we wait, one, two, three, four, five. Bam. And where is my error message? <laughs> now this happens when you do things live. Um, I didn't, did I click the button? Yes, I clicked the button again. So if I load, Something is missing. Does it go into this one? Does it go here? Uh, just put a breakpoint and we just check what's happening. Something is not correct. Three, four, five. Okay, it, it, it reached my breakpoint. And when calling schedule, it should fail because Server push is not enabled. F uh, eight step over. No, it doesn't. I would like to see the documentation. Okay, that's something I maybe have to check. Command invocation to test the enabled server push. Maybe. Uh. No, it's already disabled. It's already commented out. It, it shouldn't be active in the server push. And we also see in the logs there's no no server push request running. Mm. Okay, that will be a debugging session or something else. <laughs> something something I didn't expect to see right now. Mm. I was hoping for the error message. No, no, it's it's not active because there's no there is no, I, I can try this, but I don't believe it. Ah, I know, I don't know. <laughs> um, we get an error. It just doesn't show up because I didn't care about errors. <laughs> I didn't implement the error handling here. Um, yes. So computable future has an error handler because it's running in a separate thread. We need to do the error handling and I think is exceptionally, and then I want to handle the exception. And here I will say a dot print, print stack trace. Okay, so I forgot something. What is wrong here? Missing return statement. Okay. Something. I don't know what I know should return. I want it wants to return an exception, right? Return E. I need to check the API. Control um, Q. Exceptionally. And the return is function throwable extends T. Ah, okay. 
is it void dot return null? I don't know what I need to return. Okay, I think it's a void method, so I can only return. Okay, control shift F9, recompile. If we're lucky, it doesn't need a restart. It needs a restart, okay. And now we should see the error message. Now that's, that's one thing when dealing with threats, threats happen in a different place. So ZK cannot, um, ZK cannot handle the error because the threat is not handled by ZK. And that's why the error was just ignored. Um, so we load the page again, and now we should get a nice error in the server logs. Ah, there it is. Okay. And it says, um, illegal state exception, the server push must be enabled for desktop, blah, 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 caused by desktop must be enabled. So server push was not enabled, and that's why it can't schedule an event and the same error message you would get if you manually call executions dot activator it's a similar thing the schedule does this uh, for you in the background so good idea but i was just lazy and forgot to implement the exception handler and by the way this is similar to the promises in javascript where you have um a success and a fail function or you do next 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 and then catch this is quite quite similar just as always in java the api is much more uh, complex i think there are like 10000 methods here oh it's not too bad well there there's stuff you can do so that's the easy way huh? you implement um, a future you you do your heavy task and then you schedule and if you need a bit more control, I prepared a more complex example. Just do this one for fun. Um, control Shift F9. This should recompile without restarting. Yeah, perfect. And now the more example, more complex example. What it does it it um it allows you to run multiple in server pushes in parallel if you need. Uh, no, uh, multiple background tasks in parallel and avoid stopping the server push too early. Because this one is stopping a server push. Uh, the simple way is just enabling it and disabling it. And if there are multiple background tasks running, the first one to disable the server push will just, uh, will just um, disable the server push. So instead we enable the server push with some kind of random ID or unique ID so that the server push can do some reference counting. And only when all the unique IDs have disable the server push, it will disable it in the end. Yeah, I use random IDs, so choose whatever you like, an increasing counter, something unique um, for your task. And then I do the same thing, I run an ASIC task, I um, output something on the server so we can see what's happening. I wait for four seconds, after, after four seconds, I will schedule some kind of update to the client, say yeah, I'm 50% done, yeah, update the UI. And then I continue my heavy work. Maybe after the database query, I do some heavy processing and filtering the elements or computing some kind of AI or, or whatever. Yeah, compute something heavy and then I will update the UI again. And in the end, I will disable the server push for the current ID and the server push will stop. And by the way, these events, it doesn't matter what you call them, just call them anything. If you want to pass in some information, you will have the information of the event or the event name uh, in the event object. I usually don't need it for this scenario, huh? but you can pass in data like this or just create a variable before it huh? that's is final. Huh? Final some data and then you can use the, this data inside your long operation. Unifer plus some data. You know, just, just concatenate the stuff. And if we go back to our page, we see it started the task. It says it's halfway there. And then it's done. And after this, the server push um, is disabled. The commit request um, 
responds with a 200 and doesn't open a new connection waiting for something. So I always recommend disable server push. It's another bottleneck. If you have too many server pushes running um, in, in multiple browser tabs, you will easily run out of connections on your browser and your user will think there's a performance problem, but actually the browser just denies further requests and the user has to wait until another request finishes. So if you have many commit requests running, I think the limit is, is not very high. I think on, on, on Chrome it's six. So you can have six simultaneous requests to the same server and then it will deny any new request. So if you need more browser tabs and server push enabled, I recommend using WebSockets. They don't have this limit. And also in this case, the test button, why, is still working. We see there's Ajax requests in between the um, push requests, uh, the push updates from the server. So one way to easily improve the page loading performance by just displaying something initially, computing the stuff in the background, and using server push to update the client and then disable the server push when you're done. Okay, so this is for async. Um, I didn't prepare much more uh, for, for async because we had a longer topic about how to use event queues, uh, a longer session previously. Um, another question was about, because I assume last time I, I maybe mentioned too often that MVVM has some cost and you're some maybe afraid that MVVM will, will, um, uh, will slow you down too much. So there was the request what if I have this scenario? Uh, I have a button that should disable or that it should enable when the whole form is filled out. Um, now I have my view model. The view model has a depends on um, and has three properties, one, two, and three. And when all of these are not null uh, or could write a shorter syntax, but it, it doesn't, doesn't it, it only makes readability worse, uh, but maybe executes a, a nanosecond quicker. I have no idea. I didn't profile this one. I think it doesn't matter. Um, and it will uh, set the complete flag depending on whether these three fields are filled and the rest is just getters and setters. And there's a submit command in the end that will output the one, the, the values for one, two, and three. And the button will only activate when you, when you're done, uh, when, when you filled out every field. And I hope I interpret the question correctly, because in this in, in this scenario, the only bottleneck was um, is, is potentially the the network overhead, because you have data bindings on each of these fields, and you see every time I I type something, it will send a request to the server with the on change event, evaluating the expression whether or not to activate the button, and then. Um, uh, activating the button on demand. So now if I fill the last field, it will activate the button and then I can click the button and all the data is there. So um, if the person who asked this question is here, um, remembers this question, I would like to know if this is really the, the, um, the concern you had that there is network traffic going on. It's tiny, uh, there's 200 bytes uh, being received from the server. And in this case, what we see is the response is, for example, nothing. Yeah, it's just an empty response. And in the end, when the button enables, it will set the disabled flag to false so that the button is active. Of course, if you have larger forms and, and, and more complicated um, logic, this may be a bit noisy. But if a user is typing, he's usually not too fast. So you don't have like hundreds of requests per second. But if you have hundreds of users, of course, you have a lot of things that are being sent. And if you want to avoid this, there is something in ZK. It's not beautiful, but it's possible because the question was, can I use something like jQuery or client-side programming in general to achieve the same effect? And the answer is yes. And there's two things you have to do, or there's two things you can do. Um, I wonder which one I wanted to start with. Um, I still use the same server-side view model. So the, the benefits of MVVM at server-side are all the same. So the Java implementation doesn't change. We are only trying to reduce the number of network round trips and do some kind of client-side logic to enable the button. Um, 
this is the deferred binding and this is the before syntax. We use, okay, we start with defer binding. <clears throat> there's, there's one feature you can use is um, the defer post. It's not a nice custom attribute, it's quite long to write here. But what it will do is it will not send the, the, the on change event immediately if there's a, a safe binding. Uh, it will it will send it with the next request that needs to be sent, for example, a button click or something else. The problem is, in this case, we can't click the button because the button is disabled. So we can't just send the, the on changes it together with the button. Because the button should remain disabled until actually everything is filled out. So we need some kind of client-side logic to enable the button so that the data will fly or will be sent along with the button request with the button on click event to the server. So for this, we can do some client-side programming. If you like, you can use jQuery. Huh? It doesn't matter which, um, which JavaScript API or library you're using here. I use a little bit of, no, I, in this case, I don't use JavaScript or I don't use jQuery, just use plain JavaScript and some kind of ZK listener. So what I do is whenever, uh, first, first I defer the post, so the change event will not send immediately. So this, this will look like this. We go to the defer, and if I change the field, you see there's no request. So it saves this request, but also it doesn't have a chance to evaluate the button at the server side. And so it, because server side doesn't know about anything, about any change yet. So instead we ask the client side, uh, just implement one custom method on my button. I just call it my check enabled. And what this one does is it's locating the uh, the button by its uh, by its component ID. Um, it's similar to jQuery, but it's the zk extension of jQuery, uh, which allows you to you to to locate the button directly via via its server side ID. And you don't need the, the, the UUID of the, the unique DOM ID. You, you can use the DOM ID, but it will be ugly and you can't hard code it. You can't just put a unique ID here. So we just put uh, put the, the, the component ID directly. Um, then, um, yeah, what, what what we do in the end is we call my check enabled every time each of these text boxes changes. And we just get the values of these components, T1, T2, T3, which are these IDs. And we call it get value, get value, get value. And then if everything is not null, we enable the button and then we send information to the server. So I fill the next field, the next field, and then the button is enabled without sending anything. When I click the button, it will it will send all events together for all three text fields, text text boxes, and the button on click event. And the on uh, the command listener executes and has all the data available. So we saved a few network round trips in this case. Uh, I mean, the, the cost and uh, the implementation overhead is quite significant uh, to, to add all this stuff. So you might be better in implementing a custom component that has these custom attributes preset. Or maybe you prefer um, the, um, the conditional event binding, a command binding, where you split the load and the safe binding. And you say, I want to only send the, um, uh, I want to only save the, the current field with the with the submit command, and in this case, the event listener will also be um, also be what is it called deferred, so it will not send immediately to the server. Um, but you have to write a bit more in your bindings. But you save the extra um, the extra deferred listener. And you have a bit more control of which events should even trigger this um, this command at server side or which safe bindings should be triggered by this command at server side. The rest of the implementation is roughly the same. I chose to, to optimize my JavaScript slightly more and make it a bit slow, a bit, a bit more condensed in one line, but it's, it's up to you. Uh, it's, it's doing the same thing. It's going through all these IDs. And for every of these IDs, it's 
or is checking if every of these IDs uh, resolves into a not null value. Uh, it's just some, some JavaScript trickery, uh, but it's the same thing as previous as here. Just wanted to make it a bit more interesting for me. And if we look into this example, it will do the same thing. Uh, we use the before command. We update something. It doesn't change anything. Doesn't change anything. Still doesn't change anything. The button enables. We can click the button and it fires all the information at once to the server. Three on change events and followed by one on click. So it keeps the event order. Um, yeah. So this was about which is best, bind, load, or save, or combined. There is no best. There is always, oh, no, 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 I read the question. The question was, which is the best at bind, or at load, or at save? Um, and, and really, the, the answer is, it, it depends. Uh, if you if you can live with the default, use bind, uh, then, the, then it will do whatever you, you say. And if you need a condition on, on one of the save or on the load event, you need to split it. And there's no better or worse, it's just what you need. Um, I would try to keep it simple if you don't need it. And if you, if you need it, use it. I just gave you two alternatives. The defer will always defer the event with, until the next event is fired to the server. And this one will, um, will also defer, um, but it will only trigger the safe binding before this command. So it's a slight different, um, different thing. If I had another button uh, that, that was maybe a cancel button, it would not trigger the save button, the save event, uh, the, the save binding here, because it's a different command name. It would still send the unchange event to the server, but it would not trigger the save binding. So it depends on what you need. Uh, it's not always obvious, but uh, quite flexible. Uh, that's what you need to, do, to uh, consider. And in this case, I wouldn't care about this at all. Huh? I would just use the simple version and, and say, users are not producing high frequent noise of, of events and the events are very tiny and small and my server side logic is not expensive. So I don't need to evaluate the button every time, but you have possibility. Um, good point. Yes, with deferred events, there's a limit. Um, again, you won't have the limit if you use WebSockets because they just push plain, uh, plain uh, data blobs to the server or text text fragments. Um, and yeah, with pure requests, there are some limits. So if there's too much to have to be sent at once, um, you have to maybe require uh, uh, reconfigure your server to allow more. I don't know if this is a, a limit by uh, by the HTTP protocol or by the server actually consuming the request. Could be both, um, but from what I've, I've known, I know is that servers can be configured to accept larger um, request bodies. Yeah, and just check what else, what did I have on my list? Where's my training notes here? Okay, so we have multi-page navigation, long operations. Um, we have something else which wasn't on the list. Yeah, like what's going into this this aspect? How to reduce the the number of um, requests? Maybe I hope I, um, I interpreted this correctly. And then I think this one is is quite quite obvious. Um, often I see um, code that calls invalidate uh, just to update something. And in many cases, when you call invalidate just to get something updated, you might just have better posted a bug or ask our support to see if this one is really expected. Um, invalidate is, is very often just a workaround for something that should work correctly or should should work better. So every time you call a setter in a, in a, in a ZK component, it should update um, automatically. If this doesn't happen properly, um, I would say, uh, call our uh, support. Now, for example, if something doesn't resize properly, it's, it may be cheaper to just fire a resize instead of invalidating the whole component because invalidating will very often re-render uh, 
uh, it will clear the whole comp contents of the component and, and resend everything from the server side to the client for this component. So it's quite expensive. Now, for example, if you just add one element to a list box, yeah, calling, calling invalidate is just terrible because it will re-render the whole list box content. And I don't think I need an example about this one because we've seen what invalidate does in a previous uh, somewhere in the in the previous request when we handled the, the includes, we saw it. It's re-rendering, it's replacing the contents of an element. So if something, uh, if, if there's more happening than you expect, maybe ask us directly. There's, invalidate is often a very expensive workaround, sometimes effective, but shouldn't be used everywhere. Otherwise, you will just lose all the all the benefits over a, uh, of a single page application where you can update things individually where needed. Um, Similar similar topic is a modified change of a list model. Um, I don't have the example for this yet, so I think we have slight slightly more uh, slightly bit more time left to, to do just create one simple example, not not directory, create new file. Because um, in ZK the list model list model has the uh, has the potential to, to add and remove items on demand without re-rendering everything. And very often I see um, in an MVVM um, a notify change on a list model property, or I see in MVC someone calling a list box set model, and then it will re-render the whole uh, list box, uh, the list model content, when it might just add a single item. So we just start with the simplest case. Whoa, don't want this. I don't care about namespace here. Um, what do we have? We just do something. I also don't like uh, Descripts. Don't use Descripts in production. Yeah, this is also not good for performance. But for here, it's, it's good to demonstrate what this does. List model, list model equals new. List model, list. Where we say model dot add. I just use strings, but you, of course you know you can add any arbitrary objects in here. Just add well, just a few names: Peter, Paul, and Mary. <laughs> and then we just add a list box at the bottom that will use this model. Okay, and if we are lucky, I didn't have a typo. Um, reload, so there's my list model. So it's rendering my initial list items. What we can see in the DOM is we have inspect, and we see we have three TRs and one of them is selected here. So we can see what's updating when I click around. Now we want an extra button that adds something to the model. Button on click, I'll just give it a label equals add. And all we do is we add something to the model, model dot add. Uh, I need strings, so I need single quotes around it and double quotes inside. Also don't do this, this is inline script. It's not good for your performance. In the example, it's nice to have this. Um, another name. Okay, save this, don't need this. And we reload. Now we have our add button and we click it. Now we observe what's happening to our TRs and we add one element. Now you see whenever I add one element, it's just adding a single node and everything else remains unchanged. So that's the, the ideal way of dealing with list models. It also works if you append to a different position. So if we have another way to say we want to insert model add, I think we just insert into position 
to another name. Okay, and reload, inspect, and we say insert. I see it's inserting elements somewhere in the middle of the model. See, it, it changes a few of these um, uh, CSS classes because the even and odd styles uh, change. But it's only inserting one element. And in the network response, we should see that every time in the response, it's only adding a single list item and an implicit cell because I add a label to it. I don't have a template yet that specifies how to render the list item, but that's the default case. So that's that's about list model. And if I did the thing I don't recommend, uh, calling replace, I, I also add something to the model. I just add something to the end. And then I say, uh, I need the list box needs a ID list model, and I just say list model dot set model. That's effectively what happens when you call a modified change. You just reset the model and we reload this thing. Just add, 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 and we replace the model. And then we see it's re-rendering everything. And this is a big performance killer. Now just by reapplying the same model, it will discard the old values and add a new, uh, add all the list items new. So this is very expensive, especially in large list boxes. This will make all your other performance uh, improvements just go away by, by a slight oversight like this. It's not always obvious to see when this happens, but watch out for setting model. Ideally, just add and remove elements from the model. Don't replace the model. That's why I also recommend um, if you start with the, with MVVM, yeah, you just say init model. So you can't accidentally replace it. And then you, or vm.model, yeah, if you have a view model. This will make sure you don't accidentally reload the model. Uh, but even better, yeah, if you use the static EL, it will even save the initial binding. Is set model slower if I want to replace all items? Just, just measure, huh? we compare. <laughs> replace contents. So what we can do is we can say model, um, we say list uh, dummy, we just create a copy. Is like new, new array list model and just create, just copy the elements into a dummy list. Then we say model dot clear and model dot add all uh, dummy. I hope this, there's no typo again. Give me a Chrome, okay. So we we check, we have the replace and we have the replace contents. So which one is worse? You see, they're both exactly the same. <laughs> so up to you. <laughs> in, in this case, I think that there could be cases that are different. Um, ideally, um, if you really care about this, um, implement a model that doesn't create all list items initially. Yeah? So implement some or use the, the load on demand feature so that not all list items have to be created. And if you need even, even more, implement your own list model that only loads the list item objects from your database on demand, depending on the position that's currently being displayed. So I think that's where you can gain more than just brute force replacing everything. But in this case, um, both just look very, very, yeah, they just look the same to me. Uh, the scroll bar has the same length, so I think there's nothing 
Oh, the scroll bar is slightly longer in one case. Wait, here the scroll bar is longer. So this case is doing slightly less. Uh, I wonder why. Ah, oh, there's some update scroll position true. So another flag. But in any case, replacing everything is, yeah, if you have search results or if you sort the contents of a list, uh, that's, that's one way of, of doing this. I prefer keeping the model, just clearing and putting new elements into the model just to not have to create new objects. Uh, it's, it's in the end just a, a collection and an API around it that tells the list box what needs to be updated. And ideally, this is a single item or a few changes you make at once and not um, everything. Okay, what was the, there was another question I had about IE, uh, um, about Internet Explorer, our friend. Um, yeah, I, I know IE doesn't die in some companies, uh, but if the performance is really bad on IE, I think there's no development anymore by Microsoft to fix performance issues or to improve performance. So it's it's dead since years. They even removed their, their efforts to implement their own engine with Microsoft Edge browser. So now all Chromium engine. Um, if you really have to uh, support Internet Explorer, the only strategy I can give you is try to render less on the page. Uh, IE is always slower. It won't be faster. In some cases, we found specific CSS problems, which were very hard to track down where the CSS calculations took a long time because of certain ways CSS selectors um, can or cannot be cached in the CSS engine. Um, where we could gain some uh, performance for IE, but the development is not going in this direction. So <laughs> it's just dead. Um, uh, I see another question. I, I hope that it answers for IE, but if there are specific cases, uh, specific problems that are really terrible, um, send us uh, the ticket uh, based on your support um, availability and um, we will try to help but it's just not going into the main line by default. So we, uh, yeah. Okay, there was a question. Consider a model that has a label and a description in it wrapped into another class. If I need to change only the label, are there any ways to update the model instead of using set model? If you only want to change the label, depends. Um, ideally, if you have an instance to your label, uh, in MVC, you know, if, 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 an inst if you have an instance to your label um, component, you just call label set value. That's the fastest thing. If you want to only replace um, a single item in the list model, there is an API function. Uh, I think it's called um, um, list model. Come on. There's the API and it's not here, it's control. Um, what is the hierarchy? This one, right? Abstract list model, I think it's on this one. And control of file, it's called notify. No, it must be then only list model list. Okay, control and list model list. And Ah, here, notify change. So this is a direct method where if you have an instance to your list model and you don't want to replace the item in the list model, you just changed something on the model and you want to tell your list box, please re-render this one row, this one list item. Now you can call the notify change. Instead of adding or removing, you can just say, this item has changed, please re-render. If you want smaller control in MBVM, you can just notify change your your list model objects property, which contains the label, and then only the load bindings that have the label will re-render. But if you don't have load bindings that dynamically listen to notify changes, it's sometimes easier to just re-render the whole list item. Um, so there, there, there are many ways. Uh, um, how to observe client-side label change, which is updated from view model. That's a, 
an unusual question. Um, I think I've seen this in the forum today. Um, <laughs> Uh, how to listen from from uh, from update from uh, I don't know exactly what you're aiming at because ZK will update the values directly if you change them from the view model. I don't know what you want to listen to at client side. The browser will do the update. Um, otherwise, you can use the client side API of ZK and override the set value JavaScript method of the label widget, and then implement some side effect there. Um, Yeah, for example, override the um, the set value method at client side. No, no, not widget listener, widget override. You can just override a widget method. Mm, I wonder, can we do this easily? And just, just do one more. I think we can spare the extra five minutes, even though we're out of running out of time. Um, just create one new thing, I think. I hope this is quick. Um, label dot so we just do something at length. So we have a zk, a zk zool page, and we have a label. Huh? So let's be the value is uh, initial. Then we have a button or, or something that triggers a notified change that in the end results in calling. And label dot set. I need to on click, on click, and then we just do the ugly thing. Yeah, it's a shortcut for your notified changes in your view model. Yeah, label set value. Ah, I shouldn't do this. <laughs> and update it. So, and if you then want some kind of client side. Um, notification you can say uh, widget uh, the XML namespace widget equals client and we can override the set set value function this is now a JavaScript function now we just say function function value and then we call the super method um, this dot Set value uh, dot apply this comma arguments. This is JavaScript stuff. And what we do is console dot log value. So we just output something to the browser. And if you want to, you can set some style classes or whatever. Huh? depending on the label change. And if we try to run this, uh, we refresh label Zool and it's initially there and I click something and I got an error somewhere, label set value, label, label, in value, attempt to resolve set value on undefined variable. Okay, that's my problem. Um, ID equals label. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That's, that happens during live coding. <laughs> and I call it and it's updated. And in the JavaScript console, I see it's updated. So whenever I call it, because now, now it's not updating anymore, I need, need to give it um, give it some, some update plus system dot current time it is something like this and reload and it's updated so now every time you get some kind of javascript callback when when this method is called now what you see in the response is um, in the response you can see the set attribute response which will update the value of this widget and we just overwrote the the setter function of of this widget to do something on demand. I hope that somehow covers what you asked for because I don't know exactly when you would need this. Because in, in this scenario, if you want to change styles, you might as well just change the styles. Uh, the, the set an S class uh, from the server side. Now you can call label set S class and then you can restyle it. 
but of course, yeah. Um, if this is a performance problem, um, do this at client side. Uh, if there's something heavy to be done, maybe some weird animation yeah, that you cannot control from Java, that's one way. I will keep the example here, even though it's, I think, not totally related to performance, but it can be used to improve um, the network uh, response sizes and maybe give some uh, extra control at client side to do some effects that are not possible with constant server side communication. Okay, I think that wraps up um, today. The hours always um, finish very quickly. Um, um, thanks a lot for all the questions. Um, I quite like the dialogue as always. And I hope I covered the things and I would say, you yeah, know, thanks for joining this time. And I think we got all the topics I wanted to talk about. I don't know, maybe micromanage styles and styles and yeah, okay. ZK less spring boot with Gradle required. That's yeah, maybe maybe formulate this in more detail because it doesn't 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 say a lot. But yeah, give give us ideas what you want to hear about next. I'm always happy to prepare something if this is possible in a, in a reasonable time frame and if this fits into one hour. Um, otherwise, we are available for one-on-one -on -one sessions. So I will stop the video for now and.